Today's discussion grew out of my research for the Doctorate of Musical Arts degree from the University of Alabama. This presentation provides a pedagogical study of five pieces for younger pianists by 20th century French composers. These works can be used as an introduction to modern French piano music for elementary through early advanced students. This subject is of great importance as such works are hard to find in student level repertoire in method books. Each work is published individually by the French editor Gerard Bilodeau and it is part of a collection of 27 teaching pieces specifically designed for young people. Don't worry, I'm not going through all 27, we're just going to focus on five today. The selections will be presented in, order, in the order of progressive study, each accompanied with a detailed discussion. I will be showing you five different composers to better expose your student to the French modern style. It is possible to use all five pieces with one student in a graduated manner. However, if you want to pick and choose from this collection to more closely reflect where your student's current level is, that works as well. So I just kind of call this my own mini collection and I'm so thrilled to be sharing it with you today. These solo piano works equip the student with the skills necessary to play more difficult repertoire in the French 20th century style. I will discuss some examples as we go, and you'll find things such as embracing colorful sonorities, incorporating complex rhythms, meter changes, utilizing special pedaling. All these things will be brought out in these five pieces that I am sharing with you today. And I also wanted to mention before we dive in that these pieces are also suitable for adult students. If you have some adult students studying with you, the music uh, pu published by Bilodeau lacks colorful artwork and the large fonts for pieces that are often used for young children. So it actually can go for any age group. And um, if you're thinking, wow, this would really work for my adult student, um, you would find this a great benefit for them as well. All right, so we're going to get started now with the first piece, and this is entitled Je by Darius Mio. Mio was born in 1892 and died in 1974. And just in case you're not very familiar with some of these French composers, I'll pause at the beginning of each piece and give a brief bio about each composer. He was born to a Jewish family, of course, in France, and Mio is often recognized as a member of the well-known Lacis, a group of musicians slash composers studying at the Paris Conservatory. He did immigrate to the United States in 1940. He held teaching posts at Mills College and the Aspen Music Festival. He returned to France after 1971, and he became a professor of composition at the Paris Conservatory. He was a prolific composer, and he is unique in that he willingly and purposely composed music for amateurs and young children, as well as writing for many different genres. So we're going to go ahead and do a quick overview of this piece, Je, and the title is actually translated to English as game or play, which I think is really fun. He composed this piece about 1950. It's a miniature waltz, but it definitely has the modern sound. And it's attractive because it's simplistic and it's short. 
It's specifically written for young pianists of modest technique. Mio uses longer note values on the downbeat, so that's typical of the waltz style. There's a consistent four bar grouping, creating an accessible phrase structure for a young and an experienced performer. And so you can see on the slide that it's an ABA form. There's 52 measures total, and it's about two pages long on the Bilodeau edition. The A section measures one through 20, the B section, a bit shorter, measures 21 through 33, and then we finish up 34 through 52 at the return of the A prime section. There's some unique features about this piece that I am delighted to share with you. It has modes. So instead of using just the major or minor keys, we find that he is using modes throughout this piece. It's a great way to introduce this topic to your student or maybe review with your student. The Mixolydian mode is used most throughout this piece. And so if you're trying to remember which one was the Mixolydian mode, it's basically the major scale with a flat seven. He also uses a little bit of the Dorian mode later in the piece, which basically is the natural minor scale, but with the sixth note raised half a step. The A section begins, so this is measures one through eight. You can follow along in some of the examples showing behind me. So in measures one through eight, you'll see the C mixolydian scale, and the inclusion of the black key B flat here is creating that half step that's expected between the sixth and seventh scale degrees of this mode. The following four bar group, measures nine through 12, begins in D mixolydian mode found in examples one, excuse me, example 1 5. So these measures together represent the opening measures transposed up half a step here at measures nine through 12. So this is transposition up half a step. So we have right off the bat a beautiful example of the Mixolydian modes, uh, mode, and then at the end of the A section, we kind of get to the end of this first section, we have a return to C major, and so you find a clear use of the tonic and the dominant chords with the conclusion of the section. Section B, there is a four measure unit that does seem to center on C Dorian, that's measures 25 through 28, and then when we return to that A section at the end of the piece, we actually conclude instead of a major five to one progression, we are actually doing C minor, or excuse me, G minor, the minor five chord going to a one. So again, we're hinting a little bit of that B flat from C mixolydian is creeping back into that final progression of chords, a minor five to a one. So just giving you a little idea there of the modes and the tonal centers that he is using for this piece. Now I'm going to move forward to the pedagogical highlights that I want to talk to you about for Je. The articulation is uncomplicated for an elementary student. There's no staccato required. The slur is the primary articulation goal, but the good news is all mark slurs are just simply one measure in length and use adjacent notes and fingering. So you can see this in the example below. So there's three measures here. You notice in the first measure, the right hand has the legato marked in the D, E, F passage. And then the left hand on the second measure shown, you're seeing the left hand do adds the two note chords there with legato. Um, and then a little bit of the right hand returning on that last set of two measures, you see the legato phrasing there. So very simplistic, nothing um, too stressful for the students. The tempo here is marked without haste or hurry. And so that's an advantageous, we're not in a big hurry for these young performers, you can take your time. It's also interesting to note here that Debussy's piece, Le Peu Coulant, translating as slower than slow, shares this character of an unhurried waltz tempo. So I just wanted to point that out, that's a really neat connection. The tempos are very similar here, and they're both in this waltz of timing. Okay, I'm going to spend a little bit of time on fingering. That's always a big question mark, and this is a great place to start a student uh, with the elementary level. The fingering here in Je does include notes both inside and outside the five finger hand position. The fingering suggested in this Bellado edition does provide guidance, although there are a few places where you might consider some alternative options. So this is the first example I'm sharing with you here. The left hand is covering an entire range of an octave within measures one through three. So you notice the first half note there in measure one. Left hand, we have this middle C. And then by the end of measure three, we're an octave lower 
on that C there. So how do we get the hand to cover that distance? And I'm assuming with younger students here, maybe not quite comfortable with the full octave span. So the Bilodeau edition here marked in the small print right underneath the bass clef, you see that the um, two to three, we're starting with the middle C on finger two, turning the thumb under the B flat, and then we have A, fifth finger D, so just a five finger position. And then you could do a second finger on G and stretch down to that fifth finger on the C. So there's a little bit of a stretch there. You see in the larger format marked letter B that I suggest you could do five or one, five, one, five, two, five finger positions and just shift down one white key. So either option would be very easy to implement with your student. An example two, You'll notice that the right hand plays all eight tones found in a scale. I do want to be careful here. The composer is not seeking to establish a tone or cent tonal center, but the fingering use can still be borrowed from scalar passages. So one such passage found in example 1-5 is from measures 9 through 12. And so we start on E, we move through F sharp G all the way till we reach the next highest E an octave above that. So the right hand can you easily use the scale fingering from E major or E minor, really. So the one, two, three, cross under, one, two, three, four, five. So this ascending pattern gives you a perfect place to insert that scale fingering. It's kind of a fun fact here, I just wanted to point out, the D mixolydian in measures 9 through 12 here shares the same pitch group with G natural minor. So I just I like to find little tidbits of information to share with uh, students, and so you might find that interesting. All right, also the use of scale fingering addresses hand extensions and helps students to immediately plug in knowledge they already possess. So it's a win-win situation there. Tackling the ever-present fingering puzzle in smaller works like je is valuable, and in this case could eventually translate to a bigger piece such as Debussy's Children's Corner, uh, the Jimbo's Lullaby about the elephant here. This piano work begins with the left hand solo that can be played within the five finger or pentatonic hand position but then moves into more extended hand positions, obviously. So you can see here on the clip below, the fingering, um, the fingering marked with the letter B is alternative fingers that uses a stronger third and fourth finger on the repeated note C and D. But the letter A keeps everything within that five finger motion. So all the way through those uh, opening measures of Jumbo Zolabai, you could use that five finger position. So just showing you a little tidbit of something from a larger piece, a larger French piece. So at the end of each piece, I will pause and we'll talk about for what students would this piece be appropriate. So I said, well, we're using scalar finger patterns. There's no pedaling, the textures are thin, there's a limited dynamic range, the tempo without haste, that's a plus, a familiar ABA form set up in the modern style. The largest interval span is an octave, and at times, Mio even creates this distance between two hands instead of just the one hand that we discussed. So in my conclusion, I said, well, I think this is appropriate for an elementary level student who's already begun training in the basic piano techniques and desires to study the modern style. Would I give this to a student with a month of lessons? No, but maybe they've been studying for two or three years um, and are ready to move into something a little more challenging. So that would be who I would suggest could study this piece. The second piece that I'm sharing with you today is quite a long title in French. So it's Petite Suite Cerise pour Concert d'Ophomie by Betsy Jolas. And it translates in English as a serious petite suite for family concert. Betsy Jolas was born in 1926 and she is still living. So that puts her at 95 years old. So not only do we get to talk about a female composer, but she is one of the, uh, well, she is the only one in this set of five pieces that is still living. Um, so a little bit of background about Jo Loss, just in case you're not familiar with her work. She studied at the Paris Conservatory under Messiaen and Mio. And she was actually a prodigy also of Pierre Boulez. She holds many awards and honors for her compositions. In 1975, she became the professor of analysis at the Paris Conservatory, and she succeeded her former teacher, Messiaen, and later became the professor of composition at that same institution. 
So we'll move now to a little bit of an overview about the piece. This suite has five total movements, but they're very short as indicated by the title. The shortest movement is only nine bars long, and the entire piece in the Bilodeau edition is just two pages. That's it for all five movements. Each movement is in a different meter, so we'll talk about that a little more. And there's one note per hand or two part playing a thin texture. Like a Baroque era suite, Joe Loss includes the function of each movement in the titles. So you'll see the movements titled Prelude, Etude, Dance, for example. Unlike the typical Baroque era suite, only the fourth movement has repeated material. There are no key signatures used, although some accidentals are present, and modern stylistic elements are used in each movement. We're going to pause and play the piece here. If you'll take a listen with me. And now we'll follow with a pedagogical discussion of the piece. It's best to ID the use of five finger hand positions throughout each of these five movements. So I really feel that her compositional strategy here throughout the suite was using five finger hand positions in all of the movements. So um, the way she approaches it is these five finger hand positions can promote performance in different registers and locations on the instrument. So it's very exploratory. Joe Loss does not attempt to validate a specific tone or tonal center, but she rather explores the pitch possibilities available within those five finger spans chosen. So it really creates this fun, exploratory approach for students and helps them to avoid getting stuck with the concept of one hand position. I know uh, years ago when I first started teaching some of the most popular uh, repertoire books had the students stay within this kind of middle C hand position for, you know, depending on how long the students stay in the book, three months, six months, nine months. And by the time you move from C position and started going, well, what, this is G position. I remember the student would just be so kind of flabbergasted, like it's a whole new world when we move hand positions. So Joe Loss is bringing in, well, it could be D, E, F sharp, G, A, or D, E, F, natural, G, A. So she's very open about different possibilities here, and I think that's great for our students. Okay, so I'm gonna do a few excerpts here. So the first movement is titled Entree, and it focuses on the D and the C five-finger hand positions in the right hand. 
The left hand is going to focus on the F and the D five finger positions. So I'm going to bring you to the piano here and show you exactly what this looks like. On the second movement, we have mobile five finger hand positions. So this is explored in both the left and the right hand. Notice it's just one hand at a time. The left hand is outlining the interval of a fifth, and there's a descending sequence in the right hand where we start with the C five finger position, and we have the D, the E five finger positions in this right hand part. So we'll take a moment and I'll bring you to the piano and show you exactly what this one looks like. On the fourth movement, which is titled Etude, we have a stationary position. So the right hand, you're right here in the middle of the piano for C position. And then left hand, you're going to be using D position. So these two five finger positions are one step apart. So it's kind of a fun uh, technical issue to work with on your student. Your hands are in close proximity. And as you see on the screen, I will play this excerpt and you can look at how close the proximity of the two hands are. All right, so we'll talk about a repertoire link to other French pieces of a larger scale. So I'm moving to a Debussy piece. His piece, Voiles or Sail, from his first book of Preludes is larger, obviously more advanced than Joe Loss's piece that we're discussing here today. Yet the similar use of five finger positions is a technical skill needed in both pieces. Uh, Sails features pentatonic scales made up of whole steps. And this pattern also lends itself to the concept of mobile five finger hand positions. So there's an example that I'll share with you on the screen found in measures 48 and 49. This is example 2-4. Each hand plays the pentatonic scale F sharp, G sharp, B flat, or if you want to stay with sharp, A sharp, C, and then D. So moving up in whole steps. And then after that five finger pattern, Debussy moves the hand up a whole step and begins another pentatonic scale, starting with A flat or G sharp and harmonically. So this is what's showing on your screen here. And then there's a second piece I'll point out, also by Debussy. We're focusing on Debussy for a moment. Um, and this is an exercise based off of uh, Czerny, of course. And it's a play on these five finger exercises that Czerny is so famous for. The beginning six measures, which I show in the example below, feature a left hand C five finger position over the right hand, which is inserting this recurring A flat. And despite this very simplistic opening statement, I do want to say, of course, the piece is quite sophisticated with multiple tempo changes, meter changes. It has quick rhythms and ornaments, so I'm not taking away from that. Um, but the use of five finger hand positions, however, is featured prominently throughout Debussy's work here, as well as in Joe Loss's Petite Suite. mentioned in the opening statements about this work, there are five different meters. So every movement is in a different meter. The entree is in 2-4 time. Prelude, the second movement, is in 6-8 time. So here, Joe Loss is encouraging the pianist to group the notes into the larger two beats per measure. She does this by indicating the tempo in terms of the dotted quarter note and stemming almost every measure in two groups of three eighth notes, which is customary for this meter. So you can see this in example 2-3 above. Although 2-4 and 6-8 are different, 
primarily because they designate different note values as equaling one beat. Both of these time signatures do focus the pulse of the music into two beats per measure. I'm going to move to the third movement, which is titled Duo, and it's in 3-4 time. The fourth movement, Etude, moves into new territory. It's in 5-8. So this is grouping the rhythm into groups of three and two beats at a time. Using this approach allows this unusual time signature to be transformed into recognizable units, counting threes and twos together. In the Bilodeau edition, the stimming of the three eighth notes together followed by a single quarter note in the right hand shows support of this approach. So you can see this in the example I'm providing. Um, the first measure there in the right hand, so one, two, three, four, five, one, two, three, four, five, or if you're counting one, two, three, one, two, one, two, three, one, two. So it's very easily seen the way that they stem it in the Bilodeau edition. So it seems like, wait, 5-8 timeout. 5-8 just came out of nowhere. I mean, we're moving along 2-4, 6-8, 3-4, 5-8? Three, three, like, where does that come from? So I'm looking at 5-8 as a combination of 2 plus 3 beats per measure. Then this fourth movement is not taking away from the progression of meters, but reiterating the sum of what has already been used. So I thought that was actually quite clever of her to kind of slip in this modern time signature. Maybe your student hasn't seen this before, but it's in a way that it's very uh, plausible and able to be accomplished by a student. The last movement, the fifth movement, dance, is in 4-4 time, and it should be considered as the final installment of the path, starting with 2, 3, 2 plus 3, and lastly, 4 beats per measure. So I just wanted to share that with you on all of those meters. Seems a little overwhelming, but actually a very nice, nicely charted journey of meters. So let's conclude this discussion. For what students would this piece be appropriate? Thinking through the students you have in your studio, I would say this piece is suitable for a late elementary or early intermediate student, ready to explore mobile five finger positions in a modern style, of course. This is a multi-movement work, however, each section is quite short in length and fairly undemanding. The piece is attractive to a less experienced student. There's an absence of pedaling, lack of heavy textures, um, simplistic voicing, legato and staccato are the primary articulation goals, and this charming suite is extremely valuable, and that while it is small in size, it definitely has much to offer. The third piece we're focusing on today is Le Fleurs en Dahomey by Marcel Landowski. It translates as The Sleeping Flowers. Landowski was born in 1915, and he died in 1999. He also studied at the Paris Conservatory, and his grandfather, Henri Vuitton, is actually a recognized composer and violinist himself, so you may not have known about that connection between Landowski and Vuitton. Landowski is very interesting. He actually held a dual career. Not only was he a composer, he also was a high-ranking officer in France's Ministry of Culture starting in 1960. So he was the Inspector General of Music Education and later head of the National Department of Music in 1964 and 1970, respectively. He influenced changes in areas such as opera reform and by establishing musical groups and events. He earned the commendation of being one of the central figures in French musical life during the last three decades of the 20th century. And it's rather interesting that he died 1999, right at the turn of the century. Okay, so we're gonna move on to a discussion of the piece, just a brief overview to share with you. It is an impressionistic style piece with a beautiful flowing legato melody. The opening measures present these full upper register triads in both hands, brings to mind that lush tone of Debussy. And there's also colorful sonorities portraying the impression of sluggishness or tiredness often associated with sleeping. So the sleeping flowers is the title once again. And this kind of colorful sonority, he brings us in mostly by the use of some very well-placed accidentals. We'll talk about that a little later. This form is a succinct ABA form. You can see I've written it out for us here. The first nine measures is the A, 
section, followed by B measures 10 through 15, and then a return to A prime measure 16 through 24. And lastly, this piece has a large dynamic range from forte to pianissimo. So that's kind of a fun uh, point to make as you explore this piece with your student. We're going to pause and play the piece here. I'm going to briefly mention uh, that articulation and fingering is so important in this piece, as you just heard. And actually, there's so many points that I just love to spend all day discussing with these five pieces, but I'm just trying to narrow down um, each of the pedagogical focuses to just kind of one main point. But I do, did want to mention the articulation and fingering. You've got to have these beautiful legato phrasings. It's important in every measure. You need that technique of legato fingering and um, the B section in measures 10 through 12 especially offers an interesting study in articulation. You have the left hand marked, as you see on the screen, with legato, mezzo piano, and then legato for the right hand marked mezzo forte and then later moving on up to the forte. So you have two different articulations being performed simultaneously there. And the fingering, the first problem really that initial measure you see connecting three legato triads is required in both hands with the melody in the right hand, that upper right hand voice. So being able to talk about that and work on the voicing issues um, is going to be a big point about this piece. A similar voicing issue is found in the repeated chords in measures four through five. This one's also shown in the musical example below. And uh, so that is just one more example of where you're going to need those beautiful legato phrasings. My main focus for the pedagogical discussion is pedaling. We haven't had a piece yet uh, that focused on pedaling or even needed pedaling, but there's no pedal markings in Landowski's score, but the damper pedal is certainly needed at times to best capture the sound of this impressionistic piece, even with legato fingering. As legato slurs are the primary articulation, the use of the syncopated pedal is the best choice because it ensures the seamless flow of notes and triads is sustained. So option one that you could discuss with your student is pedaling with the harmonic rhythm. So you can see this below at example 3-5 letter A. So the pedaling here would then follow the chord changes. The syncopated pedaling was our basic play, then pedal, play, then pedal technique. The pedal could be held through the half note on the last half of the measure while the left hand plays the staccato fourth beat. So this is what I'm showing you here on the screen. So these are the options. So this is option A that I'm just discussed. And then option two would be you could try pedaling twice the measure. This is located at option B on the musical example there. Same excerpt, just looking for letter B. So you could pedal twice a measure at the half note rhythm, and this creates more of a synthesis of the two triads on beats one and two that results in this lovely shimmer of sound. More impressionistic, basically. Um, so I will demonstrate this here with an audio clip if you can listen along with me.
connecting these first two triads definitely opens up a higher plane of sonority. And that more closely fits the impressionistic style. I think it's more appreciated. Um, and as your student gets more comfortable with the style, I think they'll begin to appreciate it as well. The first half of measure three, so we'll move on to the next musical example, continues this idea of synthesis. So we're juxtaposing half steps and whole steps here. And you notice in the left hand, I'm looking at a horizontal group of notes, and then we'll talk about linear. So, uh, or verti yeah, horizontal versus vertical. So in the left hand, we have this cluster at the very beginning of the measure, B and C. I'm looking at the half notes here on the bottom, really close together. And so that would be a half step there, B to C. The upstem notes in the left hand, so the G and then the A moving to the right, the second quarter note there, are that would be the whole step. And then I'm going to direct your attention to the top, the right hand part. So the top upstem notes E down to D there would be our whole step. And then if you look back at the first beat and looking at it vertically, you see consonant intervals of a third and a fourth. So you have the right hand obviously B up to E played together. So that's an interval of a fourth. And then in the left hand, you have two sets of thirds, C to E and E to G, all this played on that downbeat here. So again, just noticing these, the synthesis of these notes all blending together, half steps along with whole steps at the same time. OK, so other examples of harmonic pedaling could be found in measures 4 and 19. And this is the example 3-7 on your screen. Here, the right hand's rhythmic structure and the use of the triadic pitch collections are similar to measures one and two. You can see that right off. Even though the left hand is more active, the use of syncopated pedaling on the first, second, and third beats allows the accompanimental eighth notes to blend in nicely with the right hand in measure 19. And I'll play an excerpt for you here. The student may find it interesting to notice how measure seven's rhythm is actually a mirror image of measures one through two, four and 19. So therefore, with that mirror image, you could actually say the pedal is backwards with a half note being the first part of the measure instead of the second part of the measure. So I like to find little interesting tidbits. So you can see those three measures together the measure in the middle is the rhythm backwards, where you would pedal the half note two beats there and then change with beat three, beat four, whereas the examples on the outer, the first and the third example, has a half note at the last part of those measures. Now, when we talk about pedal, the other discussion is, should we use a full pedal here, a full depression of the pedal? Should we have a shallow or partial pedal? So while the A section is filled with legato slurs, the pedal must be handled with care so that the musical intentions of the composer are not clouded. Isn't that a sermon we preach all the time to our students? <laughs> use the pedal carefully. The use of partial or shallow pedals is important here. Um, a full depression of the damper pedal in sections with that active left hand, those eighth notes accompanying accompaniments, get my words out here, such as found in measures four through nine, we showed that earlier, creates balance and texture problems. So you don't want to have just this complete sludge going on with the full depression of the pedal. So using shallow or partial pedals still allows for fullness and connectivity, yet it doesn't cloud the texture. There are a few places in which the full pedal would be a benefit, however. So the initial bars of the A section with its full bodied chords and both hands, you could really gain a richer sonority with the full use of the pedal. And another example would be the final half note tones at the fermata and measure nine and 24. So this is actually the halfway point and then the last measure of the piece. This is shown in example three nine on your screen. So these final half note tones are brought together with the damper pedal, allowing these dissonant E to E flat pitches to blend together. So this is a beautiful example, and I think this is really where you have some tone painting from the composer. This is where the flowers are, are kind of nodding off, falling to sleep there. So I'll play this again using the full pedal, full depression of the pedal. Now, I do want to comment 
the damper pedal is not needed at all for the majority of the B section. So this is found in measures 10 through 15, mostly because there's a light staccato accompaniment in the left hand, and it's very energetic. It propels the tempo forward here. So using the pedal would kind of negate that whole action. The right hand then is solely responsible for the legato phrasing, and this is accomplished with the help of strategic fingering and articulation, which is shown in the Bilodeau edition. So I'll share a short clip of that with you no pedal used here. Now there is a little caveat I, I do want to add in about the pedal. We've talked about the damper pedal. That's mostly where we focus our attention as piano teachers. But there's actually a couple of cases where you might consider with your student using the una corda pedal. And of course, the una corda, this might be the first time your student has used it. It's kind of a special effects uh, for most students. And I think it's a suitable introduction for the intermediate student. And you can shift the hammers, of course, with this pedal to strike only one out of three strings, hence una, one corda, one string, una corda. So this una corda pedal creates this mellowness of sound. And there's a couple of spots in Le Fleur Sans Dehemi where you could really use this as a helpful tool in creating the extremely soft pianissimo or pianissimo. And this enhances that nodding off effect of those sleeping flowers found in the second half of the measures I just mentioned earlier, measures nine and 24. Now, we always wanna link this discussion to a repertoire reference. So the French modern composer Maurice Ravel comes to mind uh, when I'm looking for a comparable example of this technique and of course a more difficult piece. His sonatine also demonstrates the need for this lovely legato melodic voice accompanied by two lower voices in the right hand. This is the first movement of a sonatine by the way. This elegant piece is written in sonata form and also has graceful melodies in the right hand. Intentional fingering, yet again, is required to successfully produce that legato line. And I'm showing you here on the screen, example 3-3. Three, three. This is the first ending in the first movement, which leads to a repeat of the exposition. So we can take a listen here. As we lead to the conclusion of our third piece together, for what students would this piece be appropriate? Landowski provides the teacher with a miniature in the impressionistic style. The beauty of this work lies in its simplicity and brevity. The key signature of E minor is familiar. So students learning that relative minor relationship to the major keys, this would be something they could latch onto and bring into their study. Use of a few additional accidentals that show the composer's tone painting they are present, but not overly so. The phrases are short and articulation brings variety. While there are many opportunities to address issues such as pedaling, fingering, large dynamic contrast. I didn't get a chance to talk about that in this discussion, but there are large dynamic contrasts. This selection is still well within the grasp of an intermediate student with three to five years of training. So of course, this is dependent on your student's personal needs. So you may have a student that's been studying five or six years, and this is perfectly within their level. So I'm just giving you kind of a large range. This is about the area that you could assign this to a student. So we are now to the fourth out of fifth pieces in our discussion today. Thank you for staying tuned in. This la uh, fourth piece is titled A la manière de Voulan by Raymond Lucheur, and that translates to In the Manner of the Violin. More about that later. A little bit about Lucheur, he was born in 1899 and he died in 1979. He's a well-acclaimed composer and teacher, and he studied under Nadia Boulanger and Vincent Dandy, so you may recognize some of those names. His cantata won the Premier Grand Prize of Rome in 1928, and he was awarded the Bizet Prize in 1935. He was actually a predecessor to Landowski, so he also held public office. He was the chief inspector of musical education and then later the inspector general of state education in 1940 and 1947, respectively. And then later on, he went to be the director of the Paris Conservatory for six years, starting in 1956. 
So three major roles there that he played. He um, composed works for flute, harp, orchestra, chorus, chamber groups, and obviously piano. Locher's music is lyrical, yet unashamedly uses chromaticism. So I really love that statement, unashamedly uses chromaticism, and we'll definitely talk about that also a little later. Also want to just include a small personal note. Why did I include this piece? When I was going through, there's 27 pieces total, as I mentioned. Um, this title really stood out to me. Um, I actually am a violinist as well as a pianist, and so when I saw this title in the manner of the violin, I was just intrigued. How can we bring the violin to the piano? What is he talking about? How is this going to work? And so that really, uh, you know, got my interest up, and then I um, started studying it, and it actually fell in line with my mini collection um, with my graduated levels of pieces. So I just wanted to point that out. It's, it's a very personal piece to me, as well as falling into this collection that we are creating together. Throughout music history, the piano has been known to take on various roles, such as mimicking the human voice, various orchestral instruments, the horn call sound for hunting, sounded for hunting in the English countryside. Even percussion instruments. You might have a few more that you could add to my list here. There's examples found in many composers' works. Bach, Chopin, Messiaen, um, also a French modern composer. As indicated by the title of this piece, our focus today imitates the violin. So let me just give you a quick review of the violin. Some of you are already familiar with the instrument, and some of you might need a little bit of a, wait, what was this about exactly? The violin's four strings are traditionally tuned a perfect fifth apart. So we start with a low G on, this would be G below middle C is its lowest string, just to kind of give you a gauge of how the lowest pitch would sound on a violin. So the composer uses this interval of a fifth frequently in this composition. He also uses its inversion, which is the fourth. So a fifth, for example, from the G string up to the D string there, that perfect fifth. And then the inversion of the fifth, of course, would be the perfect fourth. So those two intervals are used prominently throughout this piece. And then, going back to my quote earlier, he juxtaposes those two intervals with the minor second chromaticism everywhere. So there's examples of this. If you look right here in the first measure with me, and also in the fourth measure, you see the left hand presenting. Now notice this is treble clef, even though it's the left hand. The notes G and D, and then A and E. So two intervals of a perfect fifth side by side. Not only are they the perfect fifth intervals we discussed, they're also representing the lower and upper pairs of open strings on the violin, the G and D, and then the open A and E string. So this would be the complete set of violin strings with the traditional tuning. Now, measure 27 and 29, also in this example, you see the left hand's two intervals of a perfect fourth, also again, treble clef, but the left hand is playing here. You see those intervals of a perfect fourth there on the bottom. And then they coincide with the right hand. Now, this is a sixth interval. We have F, F sharp up to D there. And then that interval, looking at the eighth note, rhythms there in the right hand moves up to F sharp, excuse me, G and D. So from F sharp and D, the sixth, to G and D, the perfect fifth. So we have that recurring juxtaposition, fourth and fifth, side by side in those measures. Present are the perfect fifth, it's inversion, and then notice that he goes from the perfect sixth or excuse me, the major sixth to the perfect fifth with that half step at the point of resolution there. So that's just a perfect little in a nutshell of those points there. And then we have the rolled chords of the right hand. Now this is at measures 42 through 45, and also again at measures 47 through 49, and these are shown. These are also idiomatic of the violin's double stop technique. So if you're not familiar with the violin, we have the bow is able to reach two strings at once. We can't play all four strings with one bow stroke, but you can get two strings in one bow stroke. That's called a double stop there, two strings. So um, you have also the idea of triple and quadruple stops. We have four strings. Obviously the bow cannot play all four strings at one time. It's too big a distance for the bow to do in one stroke. But we kind of have this rolled chord arpeggio, brink, there. So I'll play a quick excerpt on the violin so you can see what I'm talking about. So 
So you'll notice the use of the intervals of a perfect fourth, e to a, and the perfect fifth, that same a up to e again, we're reflecting those two uppermost strings of the violin. And an interesting correlation here is that the arpeggiated harmony chosen in measures 42 and 43 specifically is easily translated to the violin through those open A and E strings. From a violinist perspective, even the beginning six bars could be played on this instrument by using that double stop technique of bowing two strings at a time. I'm gonna pause here now and let us listen to this entire piece and we'll come back and do a little bit more discussion. So as I mentioned, there's a lot of chromaticism that is really indicative of Landowski's style as a composer. Here in this piece, we have chromatically altered thematic material or sequences that we're going to focus on for a few moments. So the piece begins with motion propelled by half steps really in both hands, shown in the score excerpt. So measures one through five in the left hand, we're seeing that G, G sharp, A, and then back to A flat the enharmonic of G-sharp, and returning to our initial G there. So these are chromatic pitches under the tied D, all in the left hand. And so we have above that, in measure two, the right hand half-step motion goes through measure two, it repeats in measure four, the same A and E there, and then it moves that A to a B flat, up that half step. So the right hand's chromaticism is, is not as big a motion, but you see a slight shift in that bottom right hand note. So it's kind of fun to me to notice on this part that especially uh, the left hand, where you would have the G, G sharp, A, A flat, G, in my ears as a violinist, that sounds like me tuning. And a lot of times as violinists, we like to play two strings at a time to really hear the, the um, relative pitches there. Is that a perfect fit? And so the, you know, kind of sound as we're adjusting the pegs or the fine tuners, I feel like that's what he's doing. It's a little tune-up session there. And then on the A and the E string, you hear just like the A, Oh, I'm not quite sure if that A is in tune, and so I shift it up just a little bit, a little bit more sharp. Oh wait, okay, that's that's B flat too far, and I go back down. So I, I found it really amusing. I was just kind of grinning to myself as I was playing this on the piano because I was totally hearing this through the ears of a violinist. Okay, so anyway, back to our chromaticism. Lucia returns to this thematic idea of chromaticism by using transpositions and inversions of this three half step pattern that I just introduced in measure one. So measures 41 through 44 
is where we're going to focus, and we're leading later to a flourish of half steps on the downbeat of measure 45. So using the left hand's chromatically ascending pitches in the first measure seen above, and the example 4-3, as a motive, notice that the pattern is now turned upside down in measure 41. So instead of ascending, we're finding that the notes are descending. This is shown here in the example on the screen. And then this motive is also transposed, beginning with a minor third above the initial G from measure 1. We're now starting with B flat. The final four measures of this work again focus on the motive beginning in the right hand, and so this is shown below. And measure 59 moves the motive from the right hand to the from the right hand to the left hand, and we have the final E flat leads to a half step resolution E flat to D in measure 60. So the composer is actually connecting the first and the last measures of the piece with the left hand's open fifth statement of G and D. Again, those open strings on the violin. The left hand does show other cases where chromatic movement is of high importance. The left hand's the lowest voice is outlining, out, excuse me, outlining a sequence of half and whole steps in measure 12 through the downbeat of measure 14, G, A flat, A, B flat and C. So look at the lowest, the down stem note. You can follow that progression there with me. Then this pattern shown in example 4, 6 is repeated almost exactly as a transposition. So you see right below that the second musical excerpt beginning a half step higher at measure 19. So you see again the down stem notes G sharp, A, B, C, and then the last measure, D there. So if you put those two together, looking at the first measure of both examples, you see G in the first example, and then the second example is G sharp. So you see that it's just shifted up that half step. Meanwhile, the right hand's upper notes in the same bar, still looking at the same examples, um, reveal a complementary half step motion that then finishes the musical statement with the intervals of a perfect fourth. So I'm looking on the second system of that previous example, and you see half step motions there. I believe it's B to C on the very first one. And then linking this to some French repertoire, Debussy's Fireworks from Preludes book number two is where I'm going to point your attention at this time. Students will find that identifying and successfully handling sequences that are altered by transposition are skills also needed in this more advanced piece. The two upper staves that I'm showing you in the example introduce a system that is manipulated by neighboring intervals of a second, chromaticism. So in this case, the changing upper voices are indicated with the up stem while the repeating inner voices have a down stem. So just kind of giving you a little bit of a view. We're just a snapshot, so I'm trying to explain here. Notice how the notes in the second staff repeat the notes from the upper staff an octave lower. In the first two bars, the sequence moves in half steps. The upper voice is moving down a minor second. So we have a C sharp to B sharp. And then up a minor second, C sharp to D. But in the following two bars, the composer transposes that passage. So we're beginning a fourth higher at F sharp. This is measure 59, initiating a whole step motion moving down a major second. So F sharp down to E. And then we finish here with a major second up, G sharp, and then it descends a whole step to F sharp. So not only is there a transposition of the pitches, but also an enlargement of the original half step interval to a whole step. And so this is, uh, a, of course, a much more complicated work by Debussy using the same skill. A pedagogical note, <clears throat> you heard this in the recording, I did not want to neglect to speak about this, is there are obviously repeated 16th notes as a featured rhythmic motive with, throughout this work. The function of this of these notes alternate. Sometimes they have an accompanimental role, and other times it's a melodic role. So it's important for the student to understand the difference between these two primary roles, as well as how to implement the techniques required for each. So I could spend a whole other session just talking about this particular focus of the piece, but I'm going to mention it because there's a contemporary example um, 
in Ravel's piece, where you have this ever-present 16th rhythm, and this is found in the Takata from the tomb of Kupura, again, by Ravel. And it also has a similar function to those in Lushur's piece. So I'm going to show you here on the screen. And the final outcome of Ravel's piece, these passages, should be a clear layering of textures, resulting in an easily heard counterpoint at the eighth note, accompanied by the rhythmically active 16th. And as we conclude our fourth piece here, for what students would this piece be appropriate? So I'm thinking at least an upper intermediate level student would find this piece within their grasp. Pupils at this level, we're thinking they've already encountered some balancing issues be between the hands. They probably have experience with chromaticism from previous studies and have also addressed the idea of alternating fingering, which is something that will come up in this piece. The use of basic intervals, perfect fourth, perfect fifth, intervals of a half and a whole step, there's, creates this comfortable reach for the hand, so that's very doable. The range of this piece covers the middle to upper registers of the piano, encompassing about two and a half octaves total. As a result, the student is not required to play in the lower registers or to even read the bass clef. Remember, the violinist doesn't read the bass clef either, so he obviously kept that in mind when composing this piece. No pedal is needed. The most complicated rhythm in this piece is the sextuplet. And although this piece is longer in length than the one I'm about to introduce as our final selection, the skill level here require, uh, the skill level required here, let me get that straight, uh, makes it accessible to a lesser advanced student than the fifth piece that I will introduce. So we have now reached the last piece in my mini collection. This is L'Histoire des Babar, or The Petite Elephant, by Francis Poulenc. And you're probably familiar with this composer, but he was born in 1899, and he died in 1963. You may recall he's known for his simplicity. He often incorporated folk tunes and music from the cabaret in his works. His mature pieces, however, show a marked interest in religion, and his music is often ranked with fellow French composer Messiaen. Poulenc's music, music embraces the tonal and modal systems. Chromaticism, when used, is mostly in passing, and his pieces display his love for beautiful melodies and uncomplicated accompaniments. Some argue that he's the most distinguished composer since the death of Faure, and Poulenc's intentions to study at the Paris Conservatory, like our other composers we mentioned earlier, were sadly cut short by the early death of his parents. However, he was a pupil of the pianist Ricardo Vignes and was also a member of Les Cis, along with Mio earlier. The composer's oeuvre consists of works for chamber music, orchestral music, solo voice, piano music, and dramatic works for the stage. All right, so we're going to dive right into this piece. The story of Babar originates from a French children's book of the same title from the author Jean de Bruenhoff in 1931. So I absolutely love the backstory of this musical piece. The plot centers on the little elephant, Babar, who is orphaned after his mother is killed by a hunter. So it's rather a dark start to this book uh, by Jean de Bruenhoff. To avoid capture, the baby elephant runs away through the forest until he reaches a town. There he meets a rich old lady who takes him under her wing and eases him in to human society by buying him fancy clothes and teaching him manners. The story ends by returning uh, to his elephant friends and family and he gets married and becomes the king of the elephants. So it has a very positive ending after a rather dark start there. Note that this piece actually is an excerpt from much longer work of the same title for Narrator and Piano by Poulenc. And the text, of course, comes from the book. In its original state, the complete piano solo and narration is 31 pages long, and it's about 22 minutes when performed the chosen musical excerpt of our discussion is a stylized waltz that breaks into the story after the old lady befriends Babar and gives him money to buy clothes, to which he, to which he replies, thank you, madame. So Poulenc sets this piece in A flat major, so there's a very tonic, strong tonic chord present 
and the first and the final measures of this piece, each selection or each section ends on the tonic or dominant seventh chord. The waltz bass is prevalent throughout this piece, very recognizable. The composition features a returning theme that is contrasted by new material. The theme returns twice with alterations in the supporting accompaniment. And then you can see on the outline below, we have the A section, first six measures, and then the B section starting at measure seven, the A prime returns at measure 11, C section at measure 15, and then we finally conclude with that last reiteration of the A section. We're going to pause here and take a listen to this wonderful piece. Well, as we heard, this work borrows from the Romantic era character piece in which a short instrumental solo is intended to convey a story, a mood. There's no way to get away from that in this piece, and I, in fact, embrace it. I love it. Poulenc enhances this experience with that actual story being narrated and intertwined with the music. So it would be a really cool exercise, perhaps, for you and your students, should you choose this piece, to um, listen to the entire score with the narration. Um, I will say the original book is in French, so I don't know, you might be able to find an English translation performance of that, but just hearing it in context would really, enrich in, would really enrich the process for you and your student. The regular use of that low bass voice on the downbeat of most measures and the selection of the moderate tempo is possibly characterizing that unhurried walk of a large elephant. Elephants don't really run, they don't move very quickly. And so I love the way that he brings that into the character of the piece. The solo also features a variety of registers and ranges as you heard. The left hand borrows that standard Chopin accompanimental style and that the measure typically begins with a low octave single note followed by inverted triads in the higher range. You can see this on the score below. Just this very first measure here, you can see the low A flat and then inversions of that A flat major chord. There's also larger reaches in the left hand and the right hand. So L'Histoire de Babar continues that student's growth from Le Fleurs en Dormi, in which the leaping of the hand was using some extent in the B section. Now, this skill is needed virtually every measure for this piece. So if you choose to use these two pieces in a graduated manner, I think you would find some great connections for your student there. The left hand is very mobile. However, its primary function is accompanimental. So it might be necessary to review balancing techniques uh, such as ghosting, or some people call it the shadow practicing, where you play the low downbeat there, and then you simply touch the keys for the chords, but you don't actually press in. So you ghost over the top of the keys. You're not actually creating sound, but you're trying to make sure that you keep that softer balance 
and the left hand chords where you can hear the beautiful right hand melody. So ghosting or shadow practicing, you may have uh, taught that many times in your studio, I'm sure. The right hand is also required in many places to move across a wide range of notes in a short amount of time. So there's ascending arpeggiated sweeps that are marking the middle and the end points of the piece. Poulenc here is using an inverted A flat major triad played across three octaves, yes, three octaves, as a brilliant splash of color before moving into new melodic material. So you can see this on the score at the end of this measure. You have basically this gigantic grace note leading to beats two and three on measure 14. And then measure 15, you can just see by a quick glance, this looks different in the right hand than anything that has been played so far, anything that I've shown you in the musical example. So we'll get to that in just a moment. The piece ends at measure 28 with a similar arch to the upper registers with another A flat major triad. However, you'll notice here in the musical example that the composer adds F flat, G, and C flat right before that final chord. So one may notice that F flat, C flat, and G are functioning as chromatic neighboring tones to that A flat major triad. So as the final eighth note does release the tension by creating half steps with the return to the A flat major, perhaps Poulenc's intentions were to give a little chromatic color instead of just ending that expected way. You'll notice that the left hand, that low uh, dotted half note at the beginning, is written as a full measure note. So you would actually hold the pedal even through those chromatic neighbor tones. So it really is part of that complete measure sound. And then that leads me right to modern harmonies and chromaticism. So Poulenc's examples um, of brilliant chromaticism combine with accented notes. So this is what I was uh, just giving you a preview of earlier. So this is measure 15 and measure 18 in this example. In each bar, there's a dramatic flourish of the right hand descending to, in this case, the bass C flat. Whew. Bass clef is not shown in, on the screen here, but actually the left hand is playing uh, in the bass clef. So my apologies, that was a mistake on my part. So the left hand is in the bass clef and the right hand is in the bass clef. You notice that the left hand will swoop over the right hand at one point. And so by beat three of measure 15, you're in the treble clef left hand. So it's a lot of hand crossing there to think about. So about the chromaticism though, returning to that topic, these are the only bars in the piece specifically marked forte. They definitely signify a change of mood as well as volume. Perhaps this section is best understood as Babar having a flashback to that traumatic event of his mother's death. Remember, he was just a, a small elephant calf here. And seeing that, witnessing that had to be traumatic. So when I was thinking about this piece, I thought, you know what? This is so different than anything else that he's doing in the previous sections. I feel like that's really portraying the traumatic event there. So we'll pause and have a quick audio clip there. A beautifully handled sequence of descending chromaticism is also found earlier in the piece at measures seven through eight. So you're gonna see here in the upper right hand, you've got these extremely high ranges and uh, of the right hand. Also, you see there in that first measure an octave higher above that. So we're looking here at B double flat followed by a flat, so B double flat followed by A flat, so that's a half step. You have at the uh, bar line crossing there, the G to F sharp, another half step, and then moving forward on that last measure, F natural moving to E, a half step, and then E right at the end of the measure, you have E to E flat. So all of this chromaticism there in that right hand, just descending, descending in that right hand part. In conjunction with the previous passage, the left hand has beautiful harmonies in the following measures 9 through 10 that are also propelled by that half-step relationship. So with the hand consistently spanning the minor seventh interval, E flat, D flat, so these are the outer voices of the left hand, the inner voices moving chromatically, G, A flat, and then B double flat there. 
So you find that outer voices stay the same, the inner voice, and move, inner voice moving by a half step. Okay, so that gives you just a quick idea, but there's so much chromaticism there, you'll really enjoy sharing those studies with your student. And as you also heard on the recording, complex rhythms are prevalent. So the first example I'm gonna share with you is even from the beginning of this piece, dotted and double dotted tied notes followed by 30 second rhythms appear often and require that the student consistently subdivide. This is not something you wanna put at a guess. You definitely wanna count carefully. So in example five seven, which you can see, this sort of intricacy is found in measures one through four. So in beginning at measure two, each bar presents a quarter beat tied to a double dotted eighth note beginning at beat two. Every dotted eighth note is followed by one or two 30 second notes. The downbeat of measures three through four also contain another dotted eighth note followed by a 30 second note. This time there's no ties present, so a little bit of relief there. So the opening measure does contain the previously mentioned tied rhythmic figure as well as additional dotted eighth followed by 30 second notes. However, they are presented in a different order on the first measure, the tied notes being on the downbeat. So I'm showing you all these musical examples on the screen as I'm talking through this, you can kind of visually follow through there. So we will pause if you want to hear an audio clip of this. So it's challenging. It's challenging for students to keep a steady tempo while incorporating these complicated rhythms because they initially seem to go against that basic pulse. But you notice the left hand is providing a steady quarter beat accompaniment that kind of gives us our baseline here to count against. So hearing the left hand's entrances on the beat while that right hand is continuing to hold tied notes is crucial in maintaining a steady tempo. So you probably need to do some work with your student on that in the studio. Complex rhythms, for example, two, Poulenc does not limit rhythmic difficulties to the dotted and tied notes only. <laughs> he goes one step farther. So we also find triplets and sextuplets in the space of an eighth note or a quarter note. So this is measure uh, seven through eight. And we were looking at this earlier in terms of chromaticism, but you may have noticed while we we're talking about that, the rhythm's a bit complicated. The sextuplet rhythms can be problematic. Um, they are made more difficult here by the addition of the dotted 16th rest. So the students must first identify the location of the three quarter beats aided by that left hand steady accompaniment. Without that foundation, the more complex material will not clearly be understood. So if you look on the screen, I pointed out the, uh, on top of the right hand portion, the counting there. So you have the eighth note one E and then and a, uh, so you have the end of the sextuplet with the B double flat there playing, and then it goes to the downbeat of two with A flat. So you're hearing that uh, rhythm lining up very carefully. So what you wanna try especially is once you get that right hand rhythm sorted out against the quarter note in the left hand is to match the hands together entrances. Both bars have an eighth note at the beginning of each beat. Uh, so I'll say at least an eighth note. Um, of course, the left hand is mostly quarter notes there. So um, uh, there's a quarter note on beat three that matches between both hands. So this helps visual and aural organization. The sextuplet falls on the second half of the first and the third beat. So the eighth note at the beginning of the measure should initially be subdivided into sixteenths when you're first starting out, counted as one E, or however you count it, with the sextuplet following. The dotted sixteenth rest that begins with the sextuplet equals one and a half sixteenths. So one may count that as and a. Uh. As the dotted rest does not complete the final sixteenth, the thirty-second notes at the end of the sextuplet occur at exactly halfway through the sixteenth sixteenths rhythmic value. Orally, the sextuplets really kind of sound like a grace note figure before the downbeat, as the score requires the student 
to perform these rhythms either on or immediately after the final 16th of the measure. So I'm just going to conclude this rhythmic studies portion and say it's interesting to notice how the composer focuses a large portion of the right hand movement on the fourth 16th of the beat. Uh, the author and pianist Levine advises students to look at the rhythm of the composition as part of the personality of this piece. So as this rhythm is pre prevalent throughout the work, perhaps it's meant to convey that ungainly lumbering of the tired traveling elephant from our story. The narration that precedes this musical portion in the larger work begins after some days, tired and footsore, he came to a town. All right, so we're gonna take a, a break from that and talk about how can we link this piece to French repertoire? Well, there's layers of textures and voicing melody versus accompaniment and babar. These are the same skills needed in Debussy's Reverie. And so you can see a little bit of the score here that I excerpted for you. Um, and you see within both hands, we have at least the two voices there and measures nine through 10. And then of course, in measure 19, the right hand is playing um, these intervals together, these are the stemmed half notes, and then you have the whole note throughout the whole measure, uh, all, all on the right hand, and the left hand is doing these sweeping um, gestures with the eighth notes. Okay, so for what students would this piece be appropriate? Suitable for the advanced student, obviously. Um, you may be a student preparing for uh, pre-college, and even a first year undergraduate, I actually presented this to uh, one of my um, undergraduate students at the college I teach at. And it was a great introduction. It had some of the more advanced techniques, definitely dove into the modern era, but it wasn't a really lengthy piece. And uh, with the returning A sections, the student feels like, oh yeah, I, I've, I'm familiar with this passage. And so it kind of gives them a little bit of a, a sense of grounding. Um, also the use of sensitive pedaling and voicing of melody versus accompaniment, well, you gotta have a really, a really well-developed ear and excellent coordination between the hands and the feet. So not every student is gonna be able to jump right into this piece. The complicated rhythm needs precise counting, attention to detail, and that means that we're hoping the student has experience with metronome practice and obviously an ability to subdivide. The chromaticism in larger range is exciting and challenging technically, but the piece of short length may be considered a plus. So this concludes the five pieces uh, that I am sharing with you today. So first of all, I want to say thank you for staying tuned. I know this was quite a few pieces to share with you, but my sincere hope is that you may be able to take one or two of them or even all five and use them in your studio. Again, with one student, or maybe you can pick and choose what fits best for the student needs that you currently have and are working with. So um, if you're interested, there's a lot of information in my um, dissertation. And so I didn't cover everything today, but we're trying to be aware and cognizant of the time restraints. So if you are interested in um, getting the entire document, you can go to ProQuest, P-R-O-Q-U-E-S-T, and just search for my name as the author. And you actually can get a downloadable PDF free of charge. So if you're looking for a specific piece that, hey, I really wanna work on this with my student, you can get all the information that I did the research about uh, through that PDF. If you do want a hardcover book, there is one available, uh, but I will say it's a little bit pricey, so you might just wanna go with that PDF free of charge. And also, um, if you're trying to get copies of the book, the uh, Bilodeau edition, for example, of these five pieces, they're sometimes a little difficult to find, but I actually have seen them on sale at Midwest Sheet Music. So even if they don't have them immediately in stock, I'm sure that they could order them for you, um, but they're not available through Amazon at this time. So I just wanted to kind of give you a few uh, bits of information there at the end. Thank you so much for watching today, and I hope that I have encouraged and inspired you and your students with these five French modern pieces.